Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about the complex family dynamics for families struggling with mental or substance use disorders. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. Amelia Aria, Scientific Director, Parents Translational Research Center, Treatment Research Institute, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Paolo Del Vecchio, Director, Center for Mental Health Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Phil Mooring, Executive Director, Families in Action Incorporated, Wilson, North Carolina. Cynthia Moreno Tui, Executive Director, NADAC, the Association for Addiction Professionals, Washington, D.C. Paolo, why is the role of the family so important when dealing with issues of uh, mental and substance use disorders? Well, families uh, that really provide the important key aspect for people to feel loved and belonged, ultimately. And that that's really a protective factor to help people grow and develop and live healthy, happy, full lives, including uh, addressing and helping to prevent behavioral health problems from developing in the first place. Very good. Cynthia, today's world, uh, there are many definitions of a family. How would you define a family nowadays? You know, today we define family in uh, lots of different structures. It isn't just your actual blood family members. We do define it that way. However, it's who you feel connected with and who you're bonded with. So it might be friends, it might be other people in your community that you consider part of your family. And in fact, recently in LA, they did a, a family poll and they found 26 different types of family structures. So that would include same-sex families yes. and other dynamics where the grandmother or grandfather is the caretaker? Absolutely. So it could be extended family, like what you're saying. It could be what we would term a, a regular mom and dad family. However, nowadays we have a lot of single parenting going on or uh, multiple family parenting going on. So it's extensive today. Very good. Um, Amelia, what are some of the most common scenarios of families facing mental uh, or substance use disorders? What are we looking at? Is it just the parents? Is it the children? What are, we, what are some of those um, examples? Well, substance abuse can and mental illnesses can affect families in all different types of ways. Um, sometimes the parent is the one that's affected and has a substance use disorder. Other times it's the adolescent child that begins to have drug problems. These all impact the family dynamics and all have disruptive qualities on the family. Very good. And Phil, how could a family history of trauma affect those family dynamics? Well, I mean, anytime you have um, a family that's involved in a traumatic situation, we've been seeing, seems like we've been seeing um, a number of those situations lately. Uh, natural disasters, um, violence um, in our culture. And um, if you have families who have um, um, uh, history of mental illness or substance use disorders, there is some vulnerability there. And then on top of that, you layer those things that uh, occur uh, that really are beyond our control. And so it increases stressors, um, in, um, requires additional resources and support. So um, um, trauma can have a, um, uh, a tremendous uh, impact on families. Let's expand, Paolo, a little bit more on that. What are some other negative consequences? We certainly know domestic violence is, is a big issue. Um, what other uh, factors? There's many aspects of trauma that uh, can occur and, and do occur in families. And uh, issues such as childhood abuse and neglect certainly can have a, a, a significant factor. I know for me personally, and uh, of course I, I do identify as someone who's had mental health and substance use problems, and we had domestic violence in my household. And uh, I know that contributed significantly to my own problems as a child and frankly for years later. Um, but I think the important message is that people can and do overcome these issues and can live happy and full lives. 
And Cynthia, um, family members um, that are experiencing mental or substance use disorders uh, really uh, take um, a different uh, look at, at how they want to approach solving those problems. In other words, there may be another family member who, who has sort of like, I'll fix this approach. Mm -hmm. Or on the op opposite side of the spectrum, there's the denial. You're so right about that because what happens is different roles are taken on by family members. So one family member may want to be the hero and take it on and try to fix everything. And they're compulsively trying to fix things so they don't get any relaxation themselves. They're always working to take care of the family. Whereas someone else may say, you know, I'm done with this. I don't want to be involved. It's overwhelming. And so they avoid the situation and they move away from it. And then another family member may call out the situation and say, y'all are crazy or y'all need to get some, some help. And the rest of the family leaves that person alone because they feel that, that overwhelmingness that, oh, I can't look at this. So that's where the denial comes in is that it's a safeguard. It's a way to survive what's happening in the family. And then some people just start acting irrelevant. They, they, they clown or they joke or they try to take the tension off the family. So there's all kinds of ways that we, we in family systems try to cope with what's going on in the family. And Phil, what is that detrimental factor when somebody tries to be the fix-it person? Usually those, um, when that happens, it uh, becomes pretty exasperating pretty, uh, pretty, um, pretty early on. And um, that can lead to people wanting to flee from the situation, in the situation. Um, um, and then of course, all of, all of that can end up in um, uh, um, showing up in other areas at work uh, and their own personal health. Um, and so when people try to carry the entire burden of the family, and, and again, I think the message is um, it, early on is there is help. We've seen so many families who are able to reach out and um, uh, get supports in so many areas from health professionals, the faith community. I, I think we just have to continue to keep, um, keep, keep up front that there is help and there is hope. Um, just don't, don't, don't try to carry that on your own. Um, reach out. And Amelia, I suspect that there's going to be some developmental risks uh, associated to the children that experience uh, a caregiver or a parent that has a mental or a substance use disorder? Yes, but I, I think it's really important to point out that there's a lot of individual variability to the response of having a parent with a substance use disorder or a mental illness. And we don't want, we want to be careful not to stigmatize all children living in these environments. I think there's a lot of resiliency that has to be noted. There's also a lot of, like Phil said, there's a lot of supports and things that we can do to change the environment. Sometimes having a family member with a substance use problem is so isolating um, and that compounds the stigma. You don't wanna reach out for help because there's so much stigma associated with it. But I think that that's where we can play a role as professionals in trying to make it more um, feasible, um, break down those barriers so that families can seek community level supports so that it's not so isolating and that they can get help for their children and themselves. You know, while not wanting to stigmatize, certainly, but there is, Paolo, the whole issue. I know that I came from a family of an alcoholic uh, father and there was a tremendous amount of shame. Um, so, I mean, there are, uh, areas where families need to be cognizant that the children are affected tremendously, correct, Paolo? No question, and uh, you know, we've come a long way in addressing what we uh, have referred to in the past as stigma, and we, we like to talk now about issues of prejudice and discrimination, but these attitudes are so ingrained in our society, and it does uh, inhibit people from seeking help it inhibits families from reaching out and getting the support they need. Uh, sometimes, too sadly, it uh, results in families perhaps not knowing what to do or turning their backs, uh, sadly, on those that may have a mental health or addiction problems. And really, we need to do a lot more education of that. We need to educate parents and schools and the whole family about 
uh, these issues to make them more normal. And again, uh, to Phil's point that, uh, you know, help is available. Some of the best support are from other families. And uh, I think the more we can build family support and parents helping other parents and families helping families, I think that'll help a lot in the long run. And Phil, that's particularly when you're dealing with young children, um, it's particularly important that the family uh, consider getting help right away. And, and if so, how uh, do we in a family facing such issues begin to identify um, the right uh, help that we need to, to access? I, I think this is um, a very, a very uh, key point. Um, uh, over my career, I have run into so many families who um, um, it's the not my child syndrome. Uh, it can't happen here. It can't happen to me. I can't believe this is happening. And so um, I, we, we do continue to need to get the message out that um, um, families uh, need to reach out. And when they start to see um, um, something that's uh, different about their child, something that um, they, they have questions about, talk within the family. Talk to your primary care doctor. Talk to the school counselors, but uh, talk to clergy. Just start asking and inquiring and saying, here's what's going on in my family, and I'm very concerned about this. Start together. Denial is, 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 is what has brought so many families into my office before. Um, it, it's not my child. It's not here. Um, and then that allows more time to go by, the problems to get more, become more difficult to address. Mm -hmm. So we encourage families, um, ask inquire. And when we come back, we're going to continue on the theme of how families can get help. We'll be right back. It's important to help uh, families who are dealing with substance abuse and mental health disorders deal with trauma in their lives because we have increasing evidence that trauma, whether in young children or in families, really has an impact on young people as they grow up and it has an impact on both their physical health and their behavioral health. So young people who are exposed to trauma, whether in the community or in the home or at school, are more likely to, be, to have mental health and substance use issues themselves. They're also more likely to have physical health conditions. So. Uh, it's important to try to address those trauma issues early and to try to make sure that the treatment we provide those young people and their families are trauma informed and can really help them uh, deal with those issues. As a component of uh, professional intervention or um, uh, just uh, psychological intervention, you want to involve the family at least as far as uh, getting an assessment of the family dynamics and giving everybody an opportunity uh, including the identified patient to express themselves about what's going on in the family. That allows the family to recover and allows the identified uh, patient to uh, recover. I own my recovery from addiction and depression. Join the Voices for Recovery. It's worth it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. For parents and families, what's important is when you feel your child may or have a mental health or substance abuse problem, to get involved again with your school, talk with your teachers, more importantly as well as to talk to your family doctor. And family doctors can be really important resources as you're going through these kind of issues. Uh, so reaching out to schools, reaching out to your family doctors. Another support can be your faith community and the important role that faith communities can play in helping support recovery and helping support families going through these issues. Amelia, you wanted to add some thoughts. I think that when a parent has a substance use problem, one of, well, there are two major areas that are um, impaired in terms of the parenting 
One is that there are just logistical issues that aren't taken care of because the parent is more absent in the family and more preoccupied with using. The second is that the attachment between the parent and the child um, is often impaired as well. So you don't see the closeness and the emotional warmth that needs to develop. That, um, that doesn't happen as effectively when there's um, substance use in the parent. And together, those two things um, can really impact a child in a negative way, especially not only when they're young, but in the teenage years when they're looking for more supports, more emotional supports. And more structure. In more structure. One of the things I learned coming from a family of addiction, so my mother was drug addicted, my father was alcoholic, was that I learned from an early age that relationships weren't tight. You know, you didn't have that nurturing as you're talking about. You didn't have that nurturing so that relationships as you got older were more difficult and you weren't quite sure what to do with them. And you also didn't feel respected so your own individual feelings and thoughts weren't taken into consideration in the family. And so as that, that created stress and that created some, some trauma for yourself, you know, when that doesn't occur. And then you start feeling like there's no routine in the family. You don't know what to do. You know, things are up in the air, like you say, the logistics in the family aren't happening. And so the, the normal day-to-day -day routine stuff isn't happening, you don't know what to count on. So it's very disruptive and then you carry that through into your adulthood. So it becomes multi-generational. And that's why we see families maybe not drinking the same, maybe not drugging the same, maybe not the same levels of mental illness, However, you're still seeing these same types of situations happening because we pass it down from one family generation to the next. I, I would suspect, Cynthia, that it was very difficult for you to parent because in essence, what happens when, you, when you're in a household with problems is that you, you don't learn, you're not parented. Right, well you do learn. You learn the, the things you don't want. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you learn the things that you don't want to learn. And so one of the positives about getting into the profession of addiction counseling and social work was that I had to take parenting classes to teach parenting classes. And wasn't that delightful because then I began learning some things that I never knew because I didn't learn it in my family of origin. What we want families to do is to get the help that they need so they learn them while they're in their family of origin and they can teach them. And then the hope is that the next generation will be even better. And Paolo, you were mentioning uh, uh, in the first panel, you mentioned the whole notion of families helping other families. So talk to me a little bit about how that happens. How can, can adults, other adults or other families help families that have uh, issues of mental or substance use disorders? You know that there's nothing like talking with someone who's been in their own shoes, so to speak. And uh, to be able to relate to somebody uh, who's gone through similar experiences as you, who can teach you the rope, so to speak, who knows what services are available, how to cope, how to find information about services. Uh, those are valuable, valuable things that other families can teach other families. Let alone, again, just the emotional support of not feeling alone with these issues and knowing that there are other people out there and being able to relate to them is crucial. Absolutely. And Phil, in terms of getting that support, um, particularly for the young children, uh, do, they get, do they also, could they get support from their school systems? Is, are, there, are there adults that, are, that have a, a, an oversight role, teachers uh, and well, school personnel uh, to be able to identify problems? We believe prevention begins at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, parents have a, a vital role um, and um, children learn so much from their parents, uh, the messages that they get from their parents. So we be, be, believe that it begins at the kitchen table, but we also know that it's very important for parents to talk to, to the parents of the, the children that their children play with. That's, that's, that's a, a, a key juncture right there. And so um, um, parents often ask me, how can I know if my child is using drugs? And I'll say, does your child's best friend use drugs? Does your child's best friend smoke? Does your child's best friend uh, drink and drive? So, um, so parents talking to parents is, um, is, is really critical in, um, in the whole area of, of prevention. 
I think that's one of the most common things that we hear from parents who have a child with a substance use problem is that they wish they had acted earlier. And a lot of parents who think that alcohol and marijuana use are just rites of passage during adolescence really need to hear that message from the parents who have had a child, unfortunately, with a severe problem. But they have a, a big role to play in, in giving that message that there is really um, a chance to intervene before the problem becomes too big, rather than just turning a blind eye toward some things that are considered developmentally normal. These things are not, um, they're dangerous, they're not benign to have a, a child who's involved with substances early on. The most important thing is to be connected, is to connect with your, whoever are the children in your family, is to be connected and to know what's happening with them day in and day out. Put them to bed at night, ask them how was your day, it doesn't matter what their age is. This is where we, we sometimes um, think that, well, they're 16, they're 17, they don't want to be tucked in at night. They do want to be tucked in at night. They do like that routine and they like the, the positive touch. And when you take the time to do that, what happens is that you're building resiliency in that child and in yourself. And you're building that family structure that maybe you didn't have before. Maybe, maybe you, as an adult uh, parent, maybe you had your own issues with alcohol, drugs, or mental health. However, you can move that in a different direction when you take the time to do those kinds of positive interactions, putting your child to bed at night, understanding at the dinner table, what, what was your day like? What did you learn today? Little things like that make huge differences in people's lives. And that's at the young age, and I really appreciate parents who say, I am the breathalyzer in my family. I am up when my child comes, when my adolescent comes in at night, I am by the door. Um, I'm taking a whiff of their breath. I am the breathalyzer in my family. Um, they know, they know the importance yes. of being aware, being informed, being there. Paolo, about two million 12 to 17 year olds have experienced a depressive episode. And so we've talked about how children, you know, you can actually smell their breath or you can see what their eyes are like. What are some of the um, symptoms that parents need to be keenly aware of when, if their child is suffering from depression? That they could be uh, isolated, uh, isolating themselves, that they uh, school have uh, school problems in school, uh, if they're not talking with their other uh, family members or other friends, um, if they're not taking care of their hygiene as much as they have in the past, uh, if they're sad and they cry excessively, these all could be uh, uh, potential concerns that parents should watch out for. And how do they approach their child? I think uh, the key, as Cynthia and others says, is really is that connection and being uh, um, you know, a support to your child. And as a parent myself with three young kids, um, you know, I agree, Cynthia, completely about the, the need to have that time at the dinner table. I read recently that said that the most important thing we can do to help prevent behavioral health problems is for everyone to have time at the dinner table alone. Uh, and how together often does as a that family. happen now? Yeah. You know, with TV and video games and things like that, uh, but having that time together as a family unit is, is really important. I, I want to say one other thing, and that's um, about strengths, in that too often, uh, you know, we focus on what's, what's wrong with families, and, you know, all families have strengths, and we need to build on those kind of strengths and support them based on the strengths that they have. Thanks for saying that, Paula, because sometimes we get the idea that there's bad families. There are no bad families. There's families who don't have knowledge. There's families who don't have connection. There's families that have difficulty around addiction or mental health, but they're not bad families. They're families in trouble that need our extra attention in order to move to a more positive, nurturing family. And that, that's, that's what community is about, mm -hmm. is to help cause that to happen. And one of the challenges that parents have is recognizing the problem behaviors as opposed to normal adolescent development. Mm. And I think watching and being vigilant of any changes from their normal behavior is really key because during adolescence, it, the emotional centers of the brain are what 
are going to be ruling decision making. Um, you're going to have your highs and lows, but I think a parent needs to understand that every child is very different. So you may have two kids that are very, very different in terms of their ability to cope. Um, but noticing the changes and being vigilant about those changes. And is I think really parents good. have to follow their natural instinct. Um, we, we, when you're, when you have a child that's four or five years old and they're very uh, active, and then all of a sudden you see them kind of lethargic and they're not wanting to play. There, you know something's wrong. The natural parenting instinct is something is different, and you go and check, and certainly they may have a low-grade fever. But and then in adolescence parents can see the same thing. Trust your, t trust your natural instinct to know that something is different about my adolescent. And when we come back, I want to touch on what programs are available for families. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Well, the mission of the Dorchester Recovery Initiative is to promote the personal recovery for folks no matter what path they take for their recovery. We provide uh, services and activities for individuals, for family members. By coming up here for some of the groups that we have where we have the families um, interacting, we're hoping that it gives them hope to work together to make their family, their home stronger and we look to really support the recovery efforts for the, uh, the whole recovery community. We offer different support groups, Narcotic Anonymous, Alcoholic Anonymous groups. An Emotions Anonymous group, a Depression Support group, a Trauma Recovery Support group, uh, as well as just providing a safe uh, atmosphere where they can come and just chill out if they need to chill out. We help them with transportation. We help them link up with resources as far as housing, food banks, doctors. We could also give them the list of any places that may be open that they may could occupy. They can get on the computers, come up and look, uh, search the web for jobs. Whatever it takes, we help them the best way we can. Just to be able to to talk with someone. There's always someone here and their availability and being accessible. Today I'm able to make new choices and better choices. I needed a connection with a place and people who were pursuing the same thing that I was, which is um, just the hopes to stay clean. We're also looking to uh, make this a safe and healing place for family members as well, recognizing that there's a huge impact on the family for folks that have addictions and mental health problems also. We have a family night where family members can come in and share their strengths, things that they need help with. Dry Dock also has the last Saturday of every month that will be targeted for families and children to interact together. I feel it's important to involve the whole family. Therefore, they can coincide in one cohesive unit and the family can understand what that individual may be going through and be able to help them to adapt, adjust, and move on with their lives. You know, once their family member is in recovery, we have to learn to let go of the devastation that it has caused us. So I try to help family members who come in to talk to us and helping them to learning to let go. I think it's knowledge about um, how they can help in the person's recovery, whether it's uh, not to enable them in the addiction and to maybe say no or uh, sometimes give them a, a help up if they need a help up and an encouraging word. If they, if they see that they're doing their best, try to encourage them and not beat them down. And the Dry Dock has helped me to reestablish um, connections with my family and uh, my children. And it's also helping me to get stronger and it gives me a place to go to help me continue to work on my recovery. Most important thing that we hope that our participants that come here to Dry Dock take away from them is a sense of hope. We just ask that you come. And while you're here, we know that you're not, being, you're not using anything. 
you know, you're sitting down, you're watching TV, and you can participate at your own pace. You're not walking by yourself, we're walking beside you, helping you take that step at a time, learn, you know, getting you back on your feet. I've had individuals come to me and say, um, well, I've, I've accomplished this, I've accomplished that, and I thank you, and I'll let them know, you moving forward with your life in a positive manner, is thanks enough for me, you owe me no thanks. Just continue on your journey. Paolo, let's talk a little bit about best practices in terms of family-centered programs. Can you provide any examples? Sure. I think um, one of the things we know really works are systems of care approaches, wraparound approaches where that are family-driven and youth-guided. And what are those systems approaches, specifically and family-targeted uh, approaches? Those are efforts that include things like family therapy, like family-to-family -family peer supports, uh, that involve all aspects of systems that impact on a kid. So those could be school systems, healthcare systems, sometimes criminal justice systems, juvenile justice systems as well, and a wraparound approach, the concept that it really does take a community to support a family and support a kid. And um, we know through research these kind of efforts really can help in the long run. And Amelia, you are doing some research with families currently. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the Treatment Research Institute in Philadelphia is involved in designing tools and practical solutions for parents who are facing the challenge of having to select a treatment program. Um, and even before that, we're developing tools for parents to understand how to get an assessment for their child and how they can manage the problem at home when it's less severe. But when a family is in the situation of having to select a treatment program, um, we have a list of questions that a parent should ask of the treatment program to make sure that it's appropriate. But I can't stress enough the importance of understanding what the problem is um, and matching the treatment to the child's needs. Well, you talked about assessment. Tell us what parents are ought to do in terms of assessing whether or not the problem is severe or not severe with their children and ch or, or young adults. Well, I think what Phil said earlier about trusting your instincts um, about the severity of the issue um, will give you some idea of where to go. Um, sometimes if you get an answer from a physician who may not have the training to detect a substance use problem um, and the physician says, well, they look fine to me, well then maybe it's time to get a counselor involved or a private therapist um, or someone with a little bit more knowledge to really understand it. But assessment means a comprehensive picture of the mental, emotional health of the child as well as academic performance, um, to see whether or not there are drops in academic performance. All of these things together can give a parent a picture of what, we're, what sorts of challenges the, the child is facing. And I think that what's important for our audience to understand is that um, th there, is, there is a great body of research now. I mean, we have years of research and we have very effective programs that are in place that really help the family move forward. Um, and in so many cases, families uh, often say to a family, that, you know, I think my child, the, the, the person says, I think my child may be using drugs or I think my child has a problem. And my response is, what if you thought your child was having a heart, some heart issues? What would you do? Well. I would want to seek out the best specialist I could to find out what's going on. And that's what we say to, to, to families as well. Um, th there is help. There are, uh, there are wonderful people out there um, who are able to help families uh, move forward. But it begins with the, with the family saying, I think this is the problem. Let me get my child or, or my young adult to a specialist, let's do the assessment. Cynthia, um, the whole notion of, of training uh, the current workforce in addiction mm -hmm. treatment in particular that, that you're dealing with, uh, in, uh, to do a better job of adopting these best practices, 
What should families be looking for to get the best possible care uh, from that service provider? So there are specialists in addiction. So they may be a social worker, or a mental health worker, or a family counselor. However, they have specialized in addiction. And so they've gone through certain academia and experience and mentoring and supervision in order to really hone their skills. So when you're looking at addictive disorders or substance use, um, abuse, you're going to want to go to somebody who is certified or licensed as a addiction specialist. If you're concerned about mental health issues, you want to go to someone who has been trained and specializes in mental health. Many of us now are co-occurring. We've been trained in alcohol and drug and mental health. And so many of the community mental health centers, community alcohol drug centers, publicly funded centers, there's support, often reduced fees or waived fees are available. So anyone with or without money, with or without medical insurance, should be able to get some type of service. And if that service isn't available, you can go to Al-Anon, uh, which is a family self-help program. You can go to Parents Without Partners. There are many uh, community programs where you can just begin to ask questions and start to sort out, is my family needing some extra support right now? Paolo, the whole notion of a peer support, um, is there a role for peer support within the context of a family approach to uh, issues fa uh, being faced by mental or, or substance use disorders? Uh, without question, and uh, I talked already about family to family types of peer support, but also we're seeing more and more youth being involved in helping other youth and that kind of youth to youth connection. I know from my own kids and when I was a, a teenager as well that friends and that kind of peers are sometimes the most important people in your life. And so looking at ways that friends can support other friends is, is really important. And again, what, what's key for that is for people to be educated and informed. And as, it's, as it's an old saying is that the best consumer is a educated consumer and it's the same thing for families and friends that people really again need to be informed and educated the kind of tools that Amelia is developing are really important in terms of for people to know what resources are available out there what's the effectiveness of those particular approaches so that people can make informed decisions but in the peer sector do are we training peers to be able to do that Paolo we are, and uh, there are many groups who are uh, helping to do that kind of training so that peers can help other, other peers, as well as training families to help other families. And through SAMHSA and other groups, we're providing support for uh, curriculum and training to development just to do that. In some schools, they have student assistance programs. And these student assistance programs are geared to help catch kids early with alcohol and mental health issues. And some schools have peer support programs within the high school and the junior high, like natural helpers or other groups like that, that help identify kids who will be persons that other kids can come to so that they know, oh, you've been trained on how to listen and how to refer. So I'm not out there by myself in the school district either. And for parents I, uh, who really want to advocate for a stronger system, I think this is a perfect example. A parents should be advocating with their schools to make mm -hmm. sure that there are helps in place, that the student assistance programs are there. And we really encourage parents to get involved in the life of their child and the life of the, their child and how the child fits into the community and advocating for good policies in school, advocating for supports in school. Um, and there's a ton of research showing that substance use and mental disorders during early adolescence and through the college years mm -hmm. have a tremendous impact on academic performance. Most me um, mental health issues show up in pre-adolescence and adolescence. And particularly marijuana will push the brain structure to have a mental health disorder if there is a mental health disorder in that family's background. And so it's important that we're giving those young people, young adults, when they're um, starting to experiment, really good support and information about 
How does this affect your brain? And what is our family history? And why is this important to you? So that you're making good choices or choices that are informed before you use a substance or to the degree that you use a substance. And then when you go off to college, there's so much peer pressure. It's really important that the family even more so is connected with that youth and let them know we're here for you. We love and adore you. We want you to be successful. Please consider your options when you're in college. And there is no reason for parents not to be informed this day and time with, with the availability of uh, SAMHSA's resources uh, via the internet. Uh, there's no reason for parents not to know what the issues are now to address. And when we come back, I do want to go over some of those resources. We'll be right back. I felt broken. I needed help for my addiction and depression. And with the help of my family and recovery support community, I am whole again. Join, Join the Voices for recovery. recovery. It's, it's worth, worth it. it. For information on prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The mission of the Mental Health Association is to empower and assist youth, adults, and seniors to achieve optimal mental health and wellness. And we do that through education, advocacy, and treatment services. Services range from youth empowerment at a preschool age all the way through senior programs uh, such as Mid-Kansas Senior Outreach and Senior Companion Program. Some of the youth services that we have are, include outpatient treatment, uh, community-based programs for kids, uh, prevention programs, and mentoring programs for both children and adults. We do activities and we calm ourselves and we go to a room and we do a lot of fun things. I have parent support for myself. Uh, my son has therapy, case management, and attendant care uh, group. They try to teach you different strategies and different ways to do things. We have a process where the parents are providing input on a regular basis and we teach parents how to help their kids. Family is key in helping their loved one recover from the mental illness. They're key in understanding the treatment, helping their loved one understand the treatment, in getting them to appointments, helping them take their medication, understanding the symptoms and helping them actually live the life they want to live. The family needs ways, sometimes it can get overwhelming and they need support too, to be able to learn how to work with them, you know, um, the strategies, what helps them, you know, um, to get through it too, you know, they, they shouldn't have to be alone. You can't treat the family without treating the individual. You can't treat the individual without treating the family. They're all one unit. Without the family involvement, without the family support, you're missing a key ingredient to, to the road to recovery for the individual. For example, with our program, the volunteer may be providing respite for the family caregiver, some in-home services for the client, and companionship for the client, which takes care of the whole family. It is important that we assist family members in their caregiver needs because caregivers are stressed non-paid individuals, family members who provide such a difficult service 24-7 that by allowing them to take a break, they are a little more free from stress, depression, and anxiety. It really makes a difference. We offer the Senior Companion Program, the Triad Council, and the Mid-Kansas Senior Outreach Program, and focused on finding an individual who's isolated in the community, who needs help for, for safety and wellness, and to be treated as a, as a person with respect. I was 
in a very serious depression and didn't even realize quite how bad I was until uh, senior outreach started working with me. We offer a wide array of services from our crisis homes to our group homes to our supported housing to our senior housing and independent living settings. All of them are designed to help increase individuals' self-esteem and self-confidence along with giving them a safe, affordable place to live. They've all become communities within themselves where people get together, do things as a community, make friends, places where they belong. There are many, many senior people out there like me that had it not been for Mid-Kansas Senior Outreach, I wouldn't have been able to get the help that I received because I, wouldn't have, I couldn't have afforded it. It would, it would just not have been possible at all. The end goal of services is to get people where they want to go. So for some people that means they need skills that are aimed at daily living. For other people it's just helping them get their feet back under them to go back to school or back to work but we want to help them achieve the goals that they set for themselves. So it's important to have a continuum of services because everybody's needs are different. Our goal is for consumers to be able to live productive lives in a community where they feel wanted and feel a part of. And that's what we work towards. Amelia, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the messages that parents need to be given to their children. I think there's a lot of research to show that parents who provide a message of disapproval and zero tolerance during the high school years um, are very beneficial for preventing problems later. I meet with a lot of parents who believe mistakenly, and they have a view that is at odds with the research evidence, that say that if I teach my child how to drink responsibly when they're in high school, they won't explode when they go to college. And that's simply not true. It's over and over again we see that um, non-drinkers in high school, as you can delay the initiation of alcohol problems, you will reduce the likelihood later. Um, children who are non-drinkers in high school do not explode when they get to college. So I think that zero tolerance message is a really important message, but at the same time, I think we need to make sure that the communication is still intact and that there's a, it takes place in the context of a warm and supportive relationship with that child. And that research, again, shows that parents have the most influence on children not athletes, not um, movie stars. Parents have the most influence and parents have to talk to their children. And again, let me underscore, the research says the message ought to be no with illegal drugs, no, never. And you know, Cynthia, it brings up the point uh, uh, of almost saying that treatment for the caretaker and the parent is, is a form of prevention because once the parent becomes sober, then their child is going to have a better example, correct? Exactly. So parents that get services and treatment, if they have alcohol, drug, or mental health issues, they're showing an example that, yes, uh, there is help. I can change. I will change, and should you have issues, you can, you can get the help and change too. The other positive things about parents getting involved in treatment early on is that it changes the dynamic in the family structure so that the family then starts moving away from negative, um, sometimes violent, impactful situations to more positive, nurturing situations. And it's in that nurturing that the, the child and the family is able to support each other for long term and, and again that's what we want is long term health and wholeness. And really to create a very stable environment for, for right. the kids. Right. Um, we've been talking about families and, and there's some other dynamics uh, related to blended families, Paolo. What are, some, what are some of the issues that we need to be aware of, keenly aware of when you have a blended family that may have a mental or substance use issue? Families are really culturally based, and the importance of addressing the culture of that particular family, no matter if it's uh, blended, if it's extended, what the, basically the culture of that particular family unit is. And uh, you know, we talk about the need for individualized treatments and supports, and it's the same thing for families. That based on that particular individual makeup of that family is how supports and services 
need to also to be uh, tailored and personalized for that family. And Cynthia, we're, we're going to have to really note that if families cannot get help and in and time, and if they don't get the assistance they need, the courts will step in, correct? Right. So there are situations with family court now, um, particularly when you have children that are in high-risk situations, where a family court situation can step in and say there, there's ongoing neglect, there's ongoing abuse, we need to get the family into treatment. However, we're going to take the child out of that unsafe situation. We need to protect those children and put them in a, a safe home, whether or not that's a foster home or some other type of protective home, whether it's a family home. Personally, I grew up in foster care. That's from my family's addiction. So I pretty much am a child of the foster care system. I lived in that system for almost 18 years growing up. And what was positive about that is that there were homes that were protective and there were homes that weren't always protective. So it's really important nowadays that the, the family court system and the foster care system really looks to identify what are healthy homes, what are healthy situations, and move the child as quickly as possible back into a family situation that is healthy. So the families can get the support that they need in order to, to be healthy. So I think um, today we have many more options for families. And if, if you're a family member and you're seeing difficulty in your family structure, understand it's not an embarrassment for that family to push them to get help. They might not get help otherwise. And those children are so affected by not getting help that if negatively. we can, negatively, if we can get them the help right away, then they can move into a much safer environment. It becomes unsafe to stay in an unhealthy family. Children get hurt mentally, physically, sexually, and nutritionally. And it's up to us, all of us, when we see that happening, to get them the help that they need. If we see it, we need to identify it and get them the help that they need. And as we look at some of the challenges right now, um, nothing can be more glaring than, than the experience of military families, Paolo. What are some of the issues that they face and where can they go for, for help? Yeah, I, again, my own experience, I'm the son of a Korean war vet and he never much talked about his battlefield experiences, but dealt with it through the bottle and for the rest of his life was an undiagnosed alcoholic. And I know that had a tremendous impact on our family dynamics and my own health. And there are many, many servicemen and women returning from overseas in conflicts, experiencing mental health and substance abuse problems. PTSD. PTSD, one in three, it's estimated, returning servicemen and women are coming back with PTSD. Uh, again, the message here is that there is help that is available and that recovery is possible and people can overcome these issues. As we're looking, um, I'm going to go around the panel and I'm going to ask you what you think ought to be the most important thing that families need to be aware of if they have an issue either with a parent or a caretaker or a child within the family that has a mental or substance use disorder? And I'm gonna start with you. I think often parents who have a child with a substance use problem, either in the early or late stages, feel very helpless and disempowered. And I think that there are many resources for those types of parents that they need to be um, proactive in getting those resources. What web page would they go to or what? Um, we're developing some tools on the Treatment Research Institute website. Um, the Partnership for Drug Free America has um, now called partnership at drugfree.org. Um, we can provide you with some of those resources. And also they need to stay positive. I think that they can't feel disempowered as a parent. Their role as a parent is so key. It is the most important influence on that kid's life. Um, so not to give up but they also need to be um, prepared. So proactive, positive, and prepared to deal with um, something that may be chronic, something that they need to keep tabs on, that sending a child to a treatment program isn't going to fix them, that when they return home or when they are 
um, in a continuing care situation, they need to be that air traffic controller and monitor all of those activities. Thanks, Amelia. Paulo. Uh, for me, I think the uh, most important message for parents is that you're not alone and that uh, there are many other parents out there who are dealing with these issues and who have dealt successfully with them. And there are a number of groups like the Federation of Families, Al-Anon, NAMI, Active Minds on Campus, and many others that are out there that can provide that important family-to-family -family support. Very good. Cynthia. I think understanding what you have in your community is really important, that support is there. So if you go to your community um, or your county human services or your city human services department, they have a listing of all the resources that are available directly in your community. And um, they'll tell you what's free, they'll tell you what costs money, they'll tell you what takes insurance, so that you have choices. So it's knowing that you can go local, you can get the choices uh, possible, and then you can connect with them. And that, that to me is really important. Yeah. There's no silver bullet. Um, there's no perfect parent, uh, but there, um, there's a lot of help. There's a lot of support. Uh, parents have that natural instinct, I really believe, to protect their children. Parents have the most to lose. Um, we hear so frequently, all too frequently, from parents whose who've lost children, who's, um, who have children in very um, serious situations. Um, but um, there's, there's, there's help available. Parents have the most to lose, so we just encourage parents to be alert, be aware, be informed, love your children. Um, the old axiom is inspect what you expect. Um, you can't always trust children. Uh, you have to inspect what your expectations are. Love them, talk to them, and uh, enjoy life. Enjoy life. And if you have a problem, get some help. And get help. Absolutely. And I want to mention that September is National Recovery Month, and it's a month where families and communities can actually go out and celebrate those that are sober, those that are in recovery from both mental and substance use disorders. And we want to encourage you to, to go to our website, recoverymonth.gov, to be able to access information about how you too can become involved. I want to thank our panel. It's been a great show. Thank you for being here. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click on the Video Radio Web tab. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.